What a joy to be back at the Advanced Apologetics Network. Uh, that's really uh, uh, that's really uh, my home at uh, ELF. That's my my feeling. And what a pleasure for me to uh, today to introduce to you uh, Professor William Edgar, a longtime friend of uh, ELF. I. I met uh, uh, Bill Edgar already back in Shopron at one of the first ELFs. Uh, so we are so glad that uh, uh, Bill is with us. Bill is uh, an apologist and he also professor of systematic theology at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. He has a deep connection with Europe. Uh, he has lived for more than 10 years uh, in Europe and taught, uh, taught theology at uh, Aix-en-Provence in, in France. He's the author of uh, more than 10 books. The latest, if, I, if I'm right, um, is a book on uh, Schaefer and spirituality called Schaefer on the Christian Life, Countercultural uh, Spirituality. And Bill is, in addition to being an apologist and a systematic theologian, also a concert pianist, a jazz pianist. So that's a great combination of the intellectual and of the art, an apologist and musician. I don't know too many of, of those. I know a few, but uh, there should be more. And uh, Bill, we are so thankful for your contribution to uh, ALF during the years through teaching and through the concerts uh, that we have uh, enjoyed. I, I saw uh, at one pl place that the late Charles Colson described you as, quote, one of evangelicalism's most valued scholars and apologists. So scholar and apologist. If we, if we focus on, uh, on apologists, uh, where and how did your interest in, in apologetics originate? What's, what's the background for, for your apologetic calling? Yes, certainly. Well, it's a great honor to be here. And, as, and Stefan and I have been friends um, for years and years. And um, I I'm, I'm admire his leadership and his, his work on apologia and so forth. Um, so thanks for having me here. Uh, my interest started before I was a believer because I was a seeker and looked at philosophy, culture, um, hoping to find some meaning in it. Um, I grew up in, in France and of course was influenced by some of the leading philosophers there. And my favorite author was Albert Camus. Uh, hard to say where he was spiritually, but one of the great voices of the post-war um, need for humanity. And um, then I became a believer at La Brie in Switzerland and the, uh, you probably are familiar with this work, the man who, who led it and led me to Christ, Francis Schaeffer, um, was nothing if not an apologist. He spent a lot of time answering questions on things from the problem of evil to Christianity and science to the arts. And um, I was very, very nurtured by that atmosphere and so, after after Labrie, I became a school teacher and taught courses in uh, without the name what, what was apologetics. And then, as Stefan alluded to, um, we lived in Aix en Provence um, at the Reformed Seminary, and I was teaching apologetics there back in my home country. And um, uh, just very natural to me, so many changes so many different emphases. And then for 30 years, I've been at Westminster in Philadelphia, which is a Protestant seminary um, in the Reformed tradition. And uh, I've been teaching apologetics there for, uh, yeah, a little over 30 years. So that's how I got going is it's part of who I am. And in each part of my life, I was able to express uh, or articulate an interest in Christian apologetics. You, you, you said you were, were a seeker. Uh, 
um, when you first came to to Labri, what, what what kind of family background did you have? Was it was it a nominal Christian background? Would you describe yourself as an agnostic, or or what was the kind of starting point for your journey? Yeah, well, at best, my parents were nominal uh, Christians. My father was a deist. Uh, my mother, from the south in the United States, was a good churchgoer, and um, they were a part of what's been called the greatest generation. And uh, they had values such as hard work, um, Western civilization, um, some kind of ethics. But it, 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 you know, as a typical teenager, it was baseless for me. And um, so I questioned what they were trying to give me. Um, and um, when I finally got to Labrie, I found a base for ethical behavior, uh, for intellectual integrity, um, things that I didn't receive at home. I had a wonderful home, but we just weren't uh, Christians. We weren't evangelical Christians. So um, I was, yeah, you're right. I was a seeker in, in, in using that language, um, always wanting to know what was going on. Uh, uh, when uh, when I was a, a, a teenager and student in the late 70s and early 80s, in, in many Christian circles, uh, Francis Schaeffer and Labrie was a kind of household names. Um, if I've understood it right, you came to Labrie already uh, in the early 60s, 64 or something. How, how, uh, Labrie and Schaeffer was not that big uh, at that time. How, how did you hear about Schaefer and Labrie. How yeah, did you end up there? It's an interesting story. Um, so I was a uh, music student at Harvard University. And um, Harvard in those days required distribution to other areas besides your specialty. And one of the favorite courses was on uh, humanities, the history of the epic and the drama from the Greeks to the present, big sweeping course. 500 students in it, uh, but uh, divide it up into small sections just to make it manageable. And uh, my section leader was a Christian. Uh, and he made his faith known, not in a <clears throat> unnatural way or preachy way, but uh, in a very natural way in the class. And I was quite drawn to this. I'd never heard anything quite like it. And uh, you know, he knew the Greeks and he knew Shakespeare and he knew all these folks from a uh, Christian outlook. And um, we got to be good friends and he, you know, he tried to work with me and work on me. Um, and um, I was going to Switzerland in the summer of my sophomore year. Um, and he wrote down the name on a piece of paper, Francis A. Schaefer and his phone number. He said, I really want you to look this man up. He's, he's quite inspiring. So I, uh, in the middle of the summer, I, I wanted to go down there and I phoned them up and they invited me for the weekend. I, I, it was all very new to me. I had no idea. It was, as you're suggesting, he wasn't known and it was a small little community of good people. And I became a believer just in a few days, talking to Dr. Schaefer and listening to tapes, which is what we all did then, and um, hearing messages. And then I, I became resolutely converted to Christ and came back to university as a Christian, um, finished up as a Christian. So um, yeah, Francis Schaeffer, very important man in, in my life, um, monumental figure. And, and as you say, he wasn't the well-known Francis Schaeffer of today back then. But he was, uh, I knew he, he was unique and uh, a powerful figure, and he became a good friend. So that's my story. You said you, you rather quickly be become a believer uh, uh, at Labrie. What, uh, what, what was it that made the, the, the experience at Labrie? Uh, uh, so you took that, st uh, that step to, yeah. uh, to become a Christian? So I was, I was ready, but not yet a believer in my heart. Um, 
through this professor at Harvard and others. Um, so when I got to Labrie, uh, they convinced me at both the emotional and the intellectual levels that, that it had to be true. And it was a combination of answers to questions, uh, which I had many, and then uh, the spiritual life of Labrie. Uh, it was a community, and it still is, dedicated to prayer and dependence on the Holy Spirit. And um, lots happened over long meals, which as a <laughs> Frenchman appealed to me, of course. And um, that it was a magical weekend, really, uh, where everything came together. Uh, the first church service I ever attended um, as a new believer was in their living room. And this remarkable man named Randall McCauley, who's still going, preached um, a sermon that was about an hour and a half long. And I, you know, this is a whole new world to me. Uh, I was okay with that. I, I felt sorry for the mums with babies and so forth. But uh, uh, he was talking about how to reconcile James and Paul. And I was not familiar with all these issues, uh, but I was glad he could resolve them. And uh, we sang, the music was Bach chorales. So um, I, was, I was a goner. I, I, I was, you know, everything converged, including the landscape, which is astonishing in the Swiss Alps. And uh, so it was, you know, very kind of sudden turnaround, but I was, I was well prepared for it in the previous years. Yeah, it's a, a it's a um, <clears throat> it's really a powerful combination at Labrie with the uh, intellectual openness and the the uh, the spiritual the spiritual life and the the community there. Uh, so many of us have been impacted by that. Schaefer was a um, fascinating uh, thinker, and you can say, in one sense, he was very systematic in describing the dilemma of of modern man, but he did not. Uh, not uh, in any depth, at least, describe his his own apologetic method or apologetic thinking. How how would you describe uh, Francis Schaeffer as an as an apologist? Uh, yeah, well, uh, fundamentally, he was in the tradition of Abraham Kuyper and Van Til and others, looking to lay bare our presuppositions, and. Um, I think it's in his method that he was particularly dependent on that tradition. He had an uncanny way of looking at the issues behind the questions that people had and finding places of tension between what they wanted to believe and, and their practice. And so he, there was a way of opening the door to vulnerable people. Now, I agree with you that it's not, I don't think I can systematize it. It's a, at best eclectic method. Um, and I think if you're, if you're an, a philosopher or a scholar, um, you're, you're gonna be a bit disappointed with his lack of footnoting and, and so on. But at an informal level, he had a nose for great ideas and generalizations and he, um, he was so wonderfully human and uh, was driven by the gospel to love people. And all of that shone forth. I'm not saying he wasn't intellectual. He certainly was, but he wasn't uh, a scholar. Uh, he, would, he would not have claimed to be a scholar himself. He, uh, Schaefer died almost uh, 40 years ago. So that's uh, quite a long time since uh, he was active. What, what would you say is the relevance of, of Schaefer, his, his thinking, his books, his, his perspective today? Right. Um, his passion for truth, his passion for people, and his passion for the gospel. Um, the details of his analysis, you know, not all of us are on board with, with that. But um, his ability to connect uh, ideas and cultural trends 
with the Christian worldview, I think is his abiding gift. Uh, some people have called him a prophet. Uh, they've compared him to Jeremiah, you know, the weeping prophet. And I think he was, he had a prophetic side to him, which is still enduring. And uh, I noticed that young people today, at least in this country, America, uh, kind of are rediscovering him and, and liking what they find. So I, I think it's surprising in a way, but he, he uh, because he was such a man of his time, and yet these passions were, uh, I think, perennial. I have the same experience here in Sweden uh, that when people, uh, even young people today, read Schaefer's, a lot of them are really stunned by the... Uh, by his writing, and we are uh, we are in the process of of uh, um, uh, republish some of, of his books in in Swedish. So um, oh, I, I think there's still uh, yeah. is a lot of of valuable. Okay, so um, uh, your Christian uh, walk and your interest for apologetics goes uh, back to to Schaefer and Labrie, and then you have continued to be a, a teacher in Exa. Uh, Aix-en-Provence and then at, at Westminster. So how would you describe your apologetic, your apologetic approach? Yeah, yeah well, it's a good question. Um, I like to use the title cultural apologetics because I'm interested in um, ideas like I should, as I should be, but I'm also interested in trends um, hmm. and, and history and uh, the arts and um, all kinds of dimensions, the social dimension of believing. Um, and um, I think I would describe my apologetics as combining what I got from Labrie with its presuppositional awareness and contact with uh, trends. Uh, I've done a lot of work on secularization. I've done a lot of work on you know science and faith and um, world religions and all those sorts of things. Um, I've been very interested in um, Europe after the Second World War and um, why 1989 was so promising and then just didn't deliver its promise. So um, th those are, I, I think cultural apologetics probably sums up what I, what I am about. Uh. Uh, you, you are a professor at uh, at Westminster, a, a seminary associated with um, many great names as uh, Gresham Machen and uh, Cornelius Van Til. Um, and of course, in, in terms of, of a presuppositional approach, uh, uh, Cornelius Van Til is, is an important uh, figure. But in, in contemporary uh, apologetic uh, discussions, uh, Van Til, uh, is, is a somewhat controversial figure because he's he's from some corners accused of being a, a fideist whose approach people say would undermine the use of reason and, and especially the use of, of evidence. Uh, how, how would you uh, comment on that? Sure. I mean, it's, I think it's a great misunderstanding. Um, the reason that he, some people think he's a fideist is that he does mingle faith with the articulation of a Christian worldview. But his, his understanding of faith is not irrational. It's not a leap in the dark. Um, it depends on revelation. And revelation has content. Um, and so uh, a lot of people think that he's just advocating a sort of shouting match. But uh, he was very interested in the details of persuasion uh, the inner workings of philosophy and, and so on. So um, I, I think that's a lot of that's a misunderstanding. He probably opened himself to that because he was polemical. Um, I, in temperament, I am not a polemical person. And in some of his books, you know, he makes distinctions between Catholics and Protestants and evangelicals. And um, he, he's he's got a problem with each one that isn't in, in his own uh, faith tradition. Uh, that My temperament is very different from that, but that's he. I think he left himself open to such a charge. Um, it's worth reading him generously and fairly and uh, seeing how 
he was no irrationalist at all. Mm. Uh, many of the uh, the well known uh, names in in Christian apologetics today they would uh, they would describe themselves more in terms of classical apologetics or evidential uh, uh, approach. Uh, what's your view on on different schools of of apologetics? Uh, how far away are the from each other are the different schools? How is it important for for us as apologists to to choose a, a method or to belong to a certain camp here uh, what, what do you think about that yeah well each of these traditions has tremendous virtues and strengths um the Apollo, the presuppositional camp or we've now tried to rename it covenantal tries to recognize the strengths of other approaches but it, they it is concerned that um, apologetics should be from God's voice, the principium, the self-proclaimed authority of Christ, down to us, and we respond because we're his image bearers, rather than what I think some extreme classicists or evidentialists seem to do, which is to start from down here and work your way up through human reason or proofs that are, uh, you know, Aristotelian, let's say, right? more than biblical. So is it important to choose? I, I guess it is. Um, I've, I've set up camp in uh, the covenantal approach, but um, I don't want to deny the importance. My, my colleague, Dr. Oliphant and I have um, edited a two volume series on the history of apologetics through the texts. And we've got texts in there from Justin Martyr to Augustine to Qu Thomas Aquinas, uh, and of course to Machen and Kierkegaard. And we try to say, here's the virtue of each one of them. Uh, we, we try not to say, here's a problem. That's not the purpose of the anthology. So um, we, we recognize uh, the tremendous wisdom. I mean, one of my favorite apologists is Blaise Pascal. Um, you know, he was a Jansenist of sorts, and he he's not, he was not, he didn't think he liked Calvin. What he said of Calvin, I don't think he got right, but he was so insightful about man's misery and God's grandeur, and um, I just, I use him all the time in my work. So, yeah, we've got to, I think we have to be generous, uh, all the while maybe choosing a, a particular school. Mm. Uh, yeah, you, you mentioned the, this two volume uh, uh, work that you have published on Christian apologetics through history. And that was actually my, my, my next question here. Uh, <clears throat> if, if, if we look uh, back and do not look only to the 20th century with figures like uh, Francis Schaeffer and, and uh, C.S. Lewis and, and others. My, uh, my question was, what, what thinkers would you recommend, especially? What, have you, what thinkers have you learned from? You, you mentioned Pascal. Uh, are there others? Uh, if you speak here to other apologists, are there historical thinkers you, you would say, well, that, uh, that guy is especially helpful? Oh, many, many. Um, I mean, the, 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 the first great uh, apologetic, apologetics thinker who's still relevant today if, would be Augustine. Um, you know, he was on his way out of Neoplatonism, uh, but his insights along the way to, the, to knowing God, to the difference between the, the two loves and so forth, uh, so I, I read him over and over again. Um, I read Thomas Aquinas. He's easy to uh, caricature as over dependent on Aristotle. And I think there is some of that, but his insights into life and, and theology and the problem of evil are, uh, are monumental. Um, John Calvin has, uh, both Luther and Calvin have had a big influence on me. Um, Calvin's Institutes begins 
with a letter to King Francis defending the Protestant faith as being the true historic faith. And um, as, as you know, he opens with this uh, relatively new concern for knowledge. And he says, I'm not sure how we should begin because we can't know God without knowing ourselves, but we can't know ourselves without knowing God. And um, he then walks us through all the uh, dimensions of theology. Um, moving up, you know, I mentioned Pascal. Uh, this may be shocking, but I love uh, Kierkegaard. Um, I think he's been caricatured, including uh, by Francis Schaeffer, at least to begin with, um, calling him a fideist. I think Kierkegaard is rich and full of amazing understanding. Um, he, he was a unique figure. Um, his little book on the Christian life and his, his book on um, suffering and the Knights of Faith are extraordinarily um, inspiring. And um, in our own times, there's many, many people. One of my heroes and good friends is Oz Guinness, mm. who I think he's been to ELF. He came out of the Schaefer tradition, but he um, developed apologetics in awareness of the sociology of knowledge, which hadn't been done quite so well uh, be before him. You mentioned C.S. Lewis, monumental influence. Hmm. Um, and then there's lots of minor people that I, I think are uh, worth knowing about. Francis Spufford, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's a British journalist who wrote uh, sympathetically on Christianity as uh, a, a satisfactory way uh, to settle your emotions. Um, Rebecca McLaughlin, all, all kinds of good people like that. Uh, Esther Meek, who has written on epistemology, trying to use Polanyi's view of knowledge and mesh it in with the Christian faith. Um, so all kinds of, and then I read secular folks as well um, who have tremendous insights. So yeah, uh, I'm 76 now, and I'm just beginning to learn some of these things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, that overview. A, a slightly more nuanced view on uh, Thomas Aquinas and Kierkegaard than Schaefer had in his, in his yeah. books, uh, yeah. I, I, ca I can hear. Uh, you, you started out with, with uh, uh, Augustine. Uh, for um, for beginners uh, who, who want to read an actual book by uh, Augustine, what would you recommend? Oh, simple. I would recommend The Confessions. Um, it's the most remarkable piece of devotional and theological literature uh, of, of the early centuries, of any century, really. Um, it's, not, it's not exactly a biography. Um, it's a it's a story of his well it's a confession of his journey um, and how lost he was and how God found him and uh, full of insights very pastoral so that would be for me the clear place to begin hmm. lots of other things to read his most difficult work but is ultimately enriching is the city of God where he contrasts um, the city of God with the city of man. Again, he's on his way out of Neoplatonism, so the things that we might not quite agree with, but it's a writ, it's a critique of paganism. And the, the backstory on it is that Rome was in the process of being destroyed. And um, as we do when we're in a crisis, we look for a scapegoat. And many Romans decided that Christians were to blame because their God would not participate in the pantheon that protected the city of Rome. He was a creator God who didn't play ball with the others. And so the other gods decided not to protect Rome anymore. So Augustine writes, it's just the opposite. It's because we believe in a sovereign God that we're actually more loyal and more citizen-minded than many pagans are 
it's, it's a massive defense of the Christian faith over against uh, paganism. Well worth pondering. And of course, there are names in there and trends that we're not familiar with, uh, Gnostics and, um, and so on. But uh, the equivalent is still with us today. Mm. Uh, as I said earlier, you are not only an, an, an apologist, you're also an artist, a, a pianist, and, and I know you will speak in the Artist ne Network later this, this afternoon, um, and, and uh, you've been on uh, jazz tours. Um, uh, what's the connection between apologetics and your involvement in, in art? Well, um, as I say, Christianity applies to all areas of life. And so if we have a passion for truth, we should have a passion for every area. Um, for some, it's law. For some, it's government. For some, it's parenting. Uh, one of my great passions, because I grew up with it, is, is music. And I studied it at university. And um, I've developed a special interest in jazz because I love the music, but also because it... Uh, it tells the story of African-American people in slavery and in freedom. And so uh, you mentioned these tours, uh, my trio with a wonderful singer that you know, Ruth Naomi Floyd, has gone around all over Europe and uh, explained and performed, but explained the relationship between what we're performing and uh, the Christian consciousness of enslaved Africans. Um, and it's been it's been powerful. Um, you know, when we went to Budapest uh, and we we did the blues, we saw people mm -hmm. with tears in their eyes because they had suffered so much under communism and they identified with African Americans. Um, so um, that's that's a, a connection, the, a, a fortuitous thing, um, and this is really God's providence. Um, when um, I went to Labrie, I discovered this remarkable man um, who is probably familiar to most of you. He's long gone now, but Hans Ruckmacher. And he, um, he was a remarkable art historian, but had a special interest in American jazz. And he wrote a book in Dutch on, on, on jazz. And um, when I got to Labrie, I met him and I saw all these charts about the relationship of jazz to uh, the gospel. Uh, I, I don't agree with all of his, the detail, but he, uh, he saw jazz as a alternative to some of the more hard-nosed enlightenment principles that he felt governed uh, certain parts of modern music. Uh, and of course, I thought I'd, I'd reached paradise because not only was my new faith so exciting, but it included jazz. And um, so I spent all my life uh, studying and writing about jazz and performing it. Uh, I've got a book coming out next year on jazz. And, and uh, I think I like to joke with people. Um, if you don't like jazz, you're a Philistine and, and your chances of going to heaven are diminished. I'm just, it's a joke, but... Um, I think people who don't like jazz usually don't understand where it's coming from and uh, have, you know, elitism and, and so on. So, yeah, um, jazz, it's, it's a wonderful music. Yeah, and uh, the jazz tour uh, you had with Naomi was just uh, just wonderful. It's, ve it's very interesting to think about um, the way God uh, connected a lot of individuals through Labrie. You mentioned uh, Ruckmacher, uh, so Francis Schaeffer and this uh, art professor uh, got to know each other. Uh, and there's been so much spin off effect from that relationship. And you mentioned Os Guinness, who also worked for Labrie, and then you were there, and so many, so many uh, other people. And uh, in, in my mind, that has always been an encouragement to see how, how God. Uh, knits together uh, very different people who uh, very unlikely that I ever should uh, meet each other and That's and then right. there is a connection and then and a uh, huge ripple effect for uh, for the kingdom and into so many different people's lives so. 
so that is very fascinating. Well, we're looking forward to your next to your next book. Uh, uh, I mentioned what, what I, I think is your so far your latest book uh, on <clears throat> which is on on spirituality. Um, and I think many of us who are professional Christians, uh, meaning uh, you have a ministry, a leadership position, you're working for the gospel, uh, so much of your time is involved in, 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 in ministry. Um, and how do we, how do we feel, uh, how do we keep spiritual fresh? When, when you look back at your life, uh, what's your, your lessons here? How do we keep uh, our walk with the Lord authentic, real, at the same time as it's it's part of our of our of our work yeah wonderful question well some of it is the obvious uh what we call the means of grace practicing prayer going to church um being in a, a healthy fellowship reading the scriptures regularly uh so no, nothing secret, just uh, keeping up with uh, the means of grace. And then in some businesses or some rackets like jazz, um, it, it can be very lonely. Uh, there's, there's some believers out there, quite a few actually, but um, there, you know, the life is hard. You're on the road all the time. Uh, you have musicians who show up late. You have audiences who are mixed and uh, it's a great challenge, actually, to uh, to stay spiritually alive. Um, mm. and you need those means of grace more than e ever with with that kind of challenge. Um, you know, I know uh, people like Louis Armstrong read his Bible every day, and Duke Ellington believed it, much of his music was worship. And uh, so, the the best of the musicians, my heroes didn't make a dichotomy between their faith and um, and their professional practice, but they found ways to join them together. I think that's true of any profession. Uh, if you're in law, you know, there's so many pitfalls and you've got to stay spiritually alive. If you're in business or if you're in, sci in the sciences, each one brings particular challenges, but, um, needs the encouragement of of the means of grace i think this is so, so important um and here here is a um, connection to what we have been talking all, all the way through the this um <clears throat> to see your your life uh, as a whole uh, where every every uh, aspect of human existence is is relevant uh, relevant for God, so we don't separate those different issues. A, a last question. I go, go back to uh, uh, the question of apologetics. Uh, quite a lot of churches still ignore or neglect or don't really understand the the, um, the point of apologetics. Do you have any advice on how how we, con in a constructive way, can help people to to uh, to discover and and to embrace, really embrace? Uh, the apologetic work yeah uh, for me it's the flip side of the coin of evangelism um if you do evangelism without some persuasion uh you're you're being super spiritual or fideist if you do apologetics without without evangelism you're being intellectualist uh so i think it's helpful to know that it's uh, it's part of doing evangelism. It's also helpful to know that in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, but, but even going back to the old, we are mandated to do apologetics. You know, the famous text on this is 1 Peter 3.15, um, always be ready to give an, a reason for the hope that you have. And then lifting up Christ and doing it with gentleness uh, are two parts of the uh, sandwich that holds together the good meat. Um, and then example. One of the things that I most learned from Francis Schaeffer was just watching him talk to people. And um, in fact, some of us made the mistake of sort of imitating him too much. Mm -hmm. so I didn't do this, but some people 
wore the same clothes he did and everything. No, he was a mentor, not a, uh, a guru. So um, that's one of the ways to encourage people to do apologetics. And then finally, the, the prejudice against apologetics often sees it as overly argumentative. Uh, and Karl Barth famously said it took unbelief too seriously. And I, I get that. I, I don't agree with him uh, because he didn't want the discipline at all. But I, I know that it is possible to do that. So um, those are some ideas on how to help people through um, their, their problems with apologetics.